Today, I'm so glad to be joined by uh, Sarah Sellers. Uh, Sarah and I had the opportunity to first meet and connect at the University of Illinois. Um, so when I saw you were you were doing your study and continuing that that research at U of I in the carbon markets, I definitely wanted to connect and uh, and, and pick your brain on a few things. I'd be curious. I went to the U of I career fairs. I just assumed everybody else did and went to a company route. What made you want to continue research and, and uh, working at the great uh, University of Illinois? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Nick. And, and great to see you again. Uh, having, after uh, being in class together and in college and stuff, it's great to connect with you again. And so I, I got involved in, in research as an undergraduate um, I, I participated in an under, undergraduate research project. Uh, through that, I was introduced to Dr. Gary Schnitke, uh, who I worked with. And then he went on to become my PhD advisor as well. So he's kind of the person who encouraged me to, to think about uh, research as a career, to think about pursuing a master's and a PhD and, and a career in academia. So uh, I have to give him the credit. Uh, it was thanks to his mentorship and encouragement that, that I pursued the PhD. Well, was there ever a push to potentially go with the, you know, do the ACES career fair and go with the traditional company route? I shouldn't say traditional, but kind of the company route, or was it always, I was in the scholar program and kind of since day one, I always knew I wanted to continue doing that research uh, for the university. Uh, definitely throughout college, I, I was planning to, to work at a company after, after college. I had a couple great internships with some different companies, some really good experiences and, uh, I, I didn't know much about academia or a PhD. I didn't I didn't know anyone who who had a PhD in agricultural economics. So uh, definitely was not something on my radar until Dr. Schnitke uh, mentioned it to me and mentioned it that as an opportunity for me because sometimes I think as a student we look at being a PhD student and we think oh that's something I could never do. But with the right encouragement and support, uh, mentorship, and things like that. Uh, People, it's easier than people think uh, to be a PhD student, you know, like definitely when you have that support, encouragement. Very cool. And what I know our, our previous podcast, um, we had somebody on that was also kind of going with the research and she currently teaches. Um, what stage are you on in that PhD? Are you like writing your thesis or are you in year two of however long? Like what, what stage of the process are you in? Yes, I'm currently in the third year of the PhD, so uh, working on the, the dissertation. I just passed, the first year we have to pass a, a qualifying exam, so I passed that. The second year we have to uh, pass a second year paper requirement, so I passed that. Now I'm uh, working on the dissertation and hoping to be, be done before too long. Very cool. Um, so yeah, let's let's get right down to the carbon side of things. I've I'm super excited. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while because um, carbon, it seems like there's a lot of talk about this opportunity, that opportunity, uh, but maybe tangible and tactical next steps or finer details is a little more vague, at least from whenever I read some of the headlines. Um, so yeah, definitely looking for excited about uh, discussing that a little further. Let's start from the exact top. Um, what is a GHG and, and why is it important? So the main types of greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and then there's some uh, other various synthetic chemicals that are considered greenhouse gases. Uh, so these can be either caused by human activities or natural activities as well. Uh, but this is important because humans do cause some uh, significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and this does impact the environment. So managing that and, and thinking about that is, is very important when thinking about global climate change and, and the future. Again, like I kind of prefaced last time or in that last uh, comment, you know, it seems like we're hearing a lot, um, but tactical next steps as far as, you know, what can a farmer do or, or how do I get paid, et cetera. You know, if we were to describe this carbon market as maybe a baseball game, you know, what inning do you think we would be in? Are we, are we in the first? Are we singing the national anthem? Where are we at? Uh, I definitely think the game has started, but we're still in the the very beginning stages of the game. Uh, and my reason for this is because of the 
we don't have any clear government regulations yet. So I think um, if, if some of this policy gets passed, if some of these different pieces get figured out, uh, we'll definitely be moving forward in that game. But but still, things are very new. This really last spring is when everything kind of uh, took off. There was a lot of discussion, a lot of focus, and a lot of attention on this this idea of agricultural carbon markets. Uh, some of these companies have been have been doing this for a while, for, for longer than that. But I think the really uh, a lot of the focus started last last spring. Well, so let's let's extrapolate on that a little bit. Like, what are some of the current players in the carbon market today? What are some of those company names and and some things that folks should be looking out for? So there's a variety of, of different companies that are involved in the market right now. Uh, there's currently 11 voluntary carbon programs, uh, according to a document put out by Iowa State. So uh, that document's a really great resource for farmers because it kind of compares all these companies and, and what they're offering. Um, so yeah, there's there's quite a few players players out there right now. Okay. And are any of these folks, I know there's a difference between obviously a carbon credit that has to be verified and audited and all that stuff versus like, um, you know, paying for certain practices. Are some of these 11 companies, are they all encouraging practices right now? Or are there a few that say, no, we're actually ready and we've actually maybe transacted a few of these carbon credits? Yeah, so we're seeing both. We see some companies paying uh, based on carbon credit credits generated by the farmer. So they're they're trying to track a kind of a baseline level and then look at that change in uh, in emissions. Uh, but there's also some companies paid per practice. So they'll they'll give you so many dollars per acre if you switch to reduced tillage or things like that. So we are seeing both in the market. And I guess even to take a step back further, uh, and maybe we we ran before we walked, but can you describe maybe what a carbon credit is um, for the folks that might not know? So uh, a carbon credit is uh, a unit that represents uh, one metric ton of carbon dioxide or the equivalent amount of another type of gas, such as nitrous oxide or or methane, that's called a, a carbon dioxide equivalent. So this represents uh, a reduction in, in one, met, one metric ton of either the carbon dioxide or the, the equivalent amount of the gases, other gases. Okay. Is there a ratio between those other gases? Like is, is uh, nitrous oxide or some or something more potent to the environment? So it might be as not exactly a one-to-one. Yeah. So nitrous oxide uh, has more global warming potential than uh, carbon dioxide. So they, they try to put those into equivalent amounts when they, when they're talking about a carbon credit. What are you hearing from growers particularly? Because I assume they're coming to you, to Gary, to the university to probably look for answers. And again, a lot of noise out there. Um, what are you hearing from growers and kind of their feedback on maybe the folks knocking on their door saying, hey, are you interested in getting involved in this program, this program? They're probably asking, oh, what should I do? What can I do, et cetera? Yeah, so we've spoken to uh, a lot of growers, a lot of different events. So we've been trying to kind of get a feel for things out in the field. Uh, right now, from what I've heard, I, I don't know very many farmers who have actually, actually enrolled in a program yet. Um, I spoke with one one farmer at an extension event who who began the process of enrolling, uh, but then about part of the way through the enrollment process, he decided that he didn't want to do it anymore, um, kind of because there was a lot of information and work that had to be provided. I think he, he decided that he didn't want to do all that. Um, so, and... Uh, I did. We did receive a really interesting question from one farmer too. They they were asking us. Um, so there's these companies kind of acting as the the middleman between uh, the farmer and uh, a third party who who wants to buy the the carbon credits. So the farmer's question was, could I just kind of cut out this middleman? You know, I think I have this project that could generate a lot of carbon credits. Uh, could I could I get my credits verified? And they they actually already had a buyer lined up for their credits. So. I thought that was an, really interesting too. So it's interesting to hear from the farmers and, and what they're thinking and, and what their experiences are out in the field. Wow, that is that is interesting to hear. Um, I'd be curious, I, to my knowledge on those practices and sometimes the carbon credits, and correct me if I'm wrong, the grower only gets paid if he changes, he or she changes the practice and improves. 
Are you hearing from any growers that are saying, I've been doing X, Y, and Z for five years or however long, like, can I benefit from this as well? Or is it kind of too late? Yes, it's been a really big uh, criticism point of the carbon markets. Uh, a lot of farmers, I think, are, are pretty upset about that because they have been doing a lot of these practices for a long time, especially what I hear a lot is no-till. A farmer will say, oh, I've been no-tilling for years on my farm. Now I'm not eligible uh, you know, to participate in carbon markets. That's, that's not really fair. So this has been a really uh, kind of hot-button issue. And there's been some discussion about that, about... Uh, payments for early adopters or things like that. But I don't, I don't know if any of that will ever come to fruition. Now I know uh, Gary in particular, it seems like come fall or winter, he makes the circuit around a lot of different conferences talking about uh, farming cost production and then also farmland rents and landowners are very eager to hear what he puts out on the carbon front. Are landowners starting to ask you and, and Gary and other folks at the U of I questions about maybe how a landowner might capitalize on the carbon markets or how where they fit in to the equation? Sure. So we've had uh, we had a couple questions from landowners after our, our webinar on carbon markets that we had uh, a few a few months ago, uh, kind of asking, wanting to know more, wanting to learn more about how they could could get involved or what opportunities opportunities there are for a landlord landlord who wants to work directly with the companies. Um, but I don't have a clear answer. There's been a lot of discussion about uh, the contracts. So from what we've heard, uh, some contracts have a, a box that says, check here if you received your landlord's permission. Other contracts require an attestation of right to sell carbon. So I think there's a lot of variation out there in the field uh, for what type of information that the farmer would need to provide to these companies. Okay. So it might even be something of like, I assume we'll start seeing some language in leases moving forward about who owns uh, that right, et cetera. Let's, let's jump into more um, tactical step-by-step -step. hypothetically. Let's say you're the owner of 500 acres and you own and farm for simplicity purposes uh, that 500 acres and three or four of these companies that you mentioned earlier uh, come to you kind of pitching this program What's going through your mind? What do you do? What are kind of some of your next steps? So one of the, we've been offering some advice to farmers as they're kind of thinking about this, learning more, uh, reading about this and making these considerations for their business. I think a big consideration a farmer would need to think about is uh, upside price protection. So what we've been hearing from the companies, uh, there's a lot of talk about the price of carbon credits going up. So uh, the companies have been saying that there's more, more demand than there is supply uh, for these agricultural carbon credits. Uh, so we, we would expect the price to go up. And, and some companies do show that on their website. Uh, they show some graph showing some price projections. Uh, for example, Corteva has a, a graph on their website projecting that the, the price of carbon credit, agricultural carbon credits will be $60 per credit in 2030. Uh, now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, or I don't want to make any uh, any statements about what the price will do, but my point is there's some of this expectation in the market and by these companies that, that the price could increase. So I think uh, for the farmer, making sure that you have a program that protects that upside potential. So if that if that price does go up, then, then you'll get to capitalize on that. Um, another thing to think about is the, the cost of enrolling in the program. So uh, there are some maybe some software subscription costs or things like this that a farmer would need to cover uh, sharing your data. I mean, that could be uh, work and time to get kind of these records put together, things like that. So kind of thinking about some of the, the costs of entering. Um, and another thing, you don't have to commit uh, a lot of these, some of these programs. You don't have to commit, uh, you know, your whole farm. You can try try an area first, see, see how it goes, see how working with that company goes. And um, and I guess uh, the, one of the final things that I think is important is stackability. So some of these programs allow you to stack with a, a government program. So to kind of reach a higher uh, level of per acre revenue, maybe cover more of the, the cost of adopting some of these practices. So I think that opportunity to stack with government programs, if that's what, what you want to do, is important. 
Very cool. I know you guys had a great publication uh, in 2021 at FarmDocs kind of discussing some of the pros and cons and really itemizing out the prices of implementing certain strategies on the farm, uh, so which we'll, we'll link in the, in the podcast description uh, for that article. You mentioned earlier in regards to some of that federal um, regulation or kind of rules or, you know, setting the bumper lanes at the very least. I know there was another farm doc article from 2021 that discussed the growing climate solution act. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's in the works past? Like, what's the status of that? And I guess first we should ask, what is that? And then we'll, we'll move to what's the status of that. Sure. Uh, so the growing climate solutions act is uh, something that would provide more, more regulation and more of a framework for the agricultural uh, carbon market industry. It would provide uh, technical assistance for farmers who are interested in, in enrolling in carbon programs. There's also a piece of it that ensures a, a fair distribution of revenue for farmers uh, who do enroll in carbon market programs. So I think this piece of uh, legislation is important for, for farmers and the market kind of uh, maybe standardizing things a little more, figuring out some of these uh, kind of problems. Uh, so that did pass through the, the Senate, and it, it's currently in the House. I, I have not heard an update on that yet, but that will definitely be something to watch in the future and any other legislation that may come up, too. Okay. So as we're watching, and especially you as you're, as you're not only completing your, your uh, doctorate degree, you're also keeping track of this, you're also keeping track of legislation, like how do you, how do you keep track of it all? What's kind of on your morning reading list uh, to ensure you keep tabs on things? Sure. Uh, so first, of course, Farm Doc Daily is on my uh, my everyday read list. Farm Policy News. These are great resources. A lot of really timely information. Also, I, I get the AgriPulse uh, Daily Harvest, the Daybreak, the, the AgriPulse Newsletter. So all these uh, materials delivered to my inbox every day really help me kind of keep up with the agricultural news. Cool. And, and moving on, uh, adding to that, excuse me, what are some things you're focused on for 2022? Um, it could be events that you're looking towards. It could be um, yeah, just things you're keeping tabs on for 2022. I'm definitely watching the policy side of things very closely. Not only the Growing Climate Solutions Act, but um, policy overall having to do with uh, climate smart agriculture and and climate change, uh, cover crops, things like this. There's been a lot of a lot of discussion about about these type of things. So definitely watching all of that closely. Hopefully, some exciting opportunities for fa for farmers in the future uh, related to that. Um, trying to get a couple of, of papers wrapped up. We we've been working on a project. Uh, it's called Precision Conservation Management. Uh, so they they have PCM specialists uh, who help farmers input. Their, their field level data into the, the program. And um, then that the farmers can use that data to, to make decisions with, with the help of their PCM specialists. You know, they kind of help them to, to interpret that. But then we also get to work with the data, the aggregated data at U of I. And what we're looking at is uh, adopting, how do you adopt conservation practices in a profitable manner? So we do see there, there are people out there who are doing that or doing this prof profitably. So I think that's uh, something kind of exciting. And that's that's uh, a project Dr. Gary Schnitke and, and Dr. Laura Gentry, they're, they're in charge of that project. And they've been doing that for a few years, collecting that data. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get a couple of papers pushed out and get, get some of our, our findings out there. So I'd be curious on the actual payment, you know, getting a check in the mail, et cetera. How would a farmer actually get paid for this carbon credits? You mentioned a few of the companies. Is it they're getting a check from Corteva? Is it a is it a seed rebate? To, how, how's it work? So I don't know the exact details of how exactly the payment works, uh, but I know the timing of the payment can vary from company to company. So maybe part, maybe you'll get paid part of the money up front, and then after taking the measurements, you know, settling things up, maybe you'll get the rest of the payment. Uh, another thing that varies is some companies were offering a sign-on bonus over the summer, so they were offering an additional $5 if you signed on at that time. So the payment can kind of vary uh, based on when, when you sign up to. And is that payment um, you might get first or a sign-on bonus? And isn't there a 10-year window? I mean, there 
these aren't just annual things. These are, there's longer windows to a carbon credit, correct? So it depends on the, the company and kind of how long they, they lock you in for, because uh, okay. when you store carbon in the soil, uh, for example, if you switch to no-till, but if you decide to till the next year, then, then that can re release the, the carbon that you've stored. So uh, kind of the locking in some of that for the long term can be important to, to make sure that these changes are actually uh, st staying implemented for the long term. What the carbon that's stored there is, is going to stay there. Uh, do companies, have you ever heard from like companies um, that are maybe buying these carbon credits or are folks that are just generally interested in purchasing them? Are they hesitant for this kind of soil farmer based carbon credit? Um, because you can, you know, do good practices for X years and then the land or the farmer switches and he implements different practices and then you're kind of releasing all that carbon back into the air, aren't you? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I was at a sustainable agriculture conference um, in the fall. It was a lot of these companies were there and they were talking about their programs uh, and some of the challenges they faced. And uh, I think this idea is always going to be challenging because you're trying to model a, a biological system, which is the soil, uh, using a, a model. And that's that's really challenging to do to to take something in nature and, and, and try to model it. And uh, we know that can, can never be exactly perfect, but I think a lot of these companies, they're really, they're trying to do the best they can uh, with what they have. And uh, one company, I heard them kind of make the point, uh, good is better than perfect. So uh, getting started, getting started, getting these markets evolving uh, and kind of the, the competition between the companies that's, that's driving them, uh, to you know, increase the price or 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 change their terms, things like that. Uh, this is all all good for the farmers. So, um, yeah, I think it's hard from the company side to, to 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 think about this, but I think it's a really exciting exciting time, exciting opportunity for everyone. I, I love the note. Don't let uh, what is it? Don't let good get in the way of great, or don't let great get in the way of good. Um, I think that's some one should hold in their life, etc. Um, I'd be curious. Do you guys, does anybody ever discuss or talk about, you know, you talked about, hey, these carbon programs are at these prices right now, but we, a lot of folks expect them to increase. And there's kind of these, and right now, people, Corteva, Monsanto are paying for potentially these carbon credits or practice improvements. Is there discussion that the CME or somebody might create a futures contract around a carbon credit or like, is that being discussed at all? Uh, so there was um, the uh, CCX, the Chicago Chicago Climate Exchange, that uh, traded previously, but then uh, it ceased trading due to inactivity. And, and when it stopped, the the price was really low uh, for carbon credits. So a lot of people they they kind of use that as an argument against carbon credits. Now they say, oh, well, we tried that before and it didn't work. Um, but I think. Now we're kind of in this different policy environment. Uh, there's more demand, so maybe things are a little bit different. But going back to your original question, I I do believe that they they've either discussed or started actually doing this again, this uh, kind of climate exchange. But I don't know all the details, so I don't want to uh, don't want to speak on that. But I, I have heard uh, there is something like that or coming back. Okay, and when was the when was that CCX in? Uh, was it, when was it live? Was this like two years ago, three years ago, six months ago? Okay. Uh, yeah, that trade from 2003 to 2010. So when, and when it ceased trading at the end of 2010, the effective final price uh, for carbon credit was somewhere between five and 10 cents. So really low. Wow. 2003 and 2000, they were, they were way ahead of their time. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it seems like we're on this cutting edge, bleeding edge right now. And if you're talking about that in 2003, oof, bravo. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people see that and they, they say, oh, we tried that before and it, it didn't work. But um, I kind of have hopes. My, my take on it is I think this time could be different, but we'll see what happens. Cool. So, so are you doing like, is that your full PhD route is, is this carbon program and you hope to, is that what your thesis is based on and are 
if you haven't started writing it, your dissertation. Is it dissertation or thesis? Uh, dissertation, yes. Uh, so this was kind of a side uh, project I, I kind of got involved in. after I went to a webinar last spring about agricultural carbon markets, and I thought, wow, uh, farmers need information about this. So kind of I led to putting together that Farm Doc Daily article to kind of get, get some information out there to help people think about different different things. Uh, but my dissertation, it's going to be more focused on uh, the, the adopting conservation uh, practices profitably. So I'm working with this data from Precision Conservation Management. Uh, we're looking at the maximum return to nitrogen recommendation from the University of Illinois. So the first paper kind of looks at uh, our farmers using the MRTN recommendation. And we find that a lot of farmers are applying uh, nitrogen rates above the MRTN. Uh, also, our preliminary results suggest that farmers who, who do apply at the MRTN uh, have higher operator land returns than, than farmers who don't. And even though farmers who apply above the MRTN have higher, higher yields in our results. Uh, so this kind of led to the next paper. So why, why aren't farmers following the MRTN? And while, while we couldn't quite get at that, we, we tried to find some factors related to uh, farmers following the MRTN. So we found that Farmers who have their nitrogen custom applied uh, by an agricultural retailer are, are kind of less likely to apply at the MRTN. Farmers who are involved in an NRCS program or who use cover crops uh, or who use reduced or no-till, they're, they're more likely to apply at the MRTN. So these are still, we're still working on, on both these papers, but kind of our preliminary findings. Cool, cool. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we covered a lot. Uh, hopefully this helps. Again, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, we will link uh, to some of the very helpful farm doc articles that you referenced that Iowa State list. Um, obviously, we'll put the farm doc Iowa uh, articles ahead, just as ranking as the uh, land grant universities are one and two uh, for ag purposes. And uh, yeah, Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, great seeing you again and uh, great, great being here and talking with you today.